Okay. All right, let's get started, probably. Okay. But yeah, my first note, so some, some of you were asking about the project number two, the Gaussian elimination, the first version. That is supposed to fail on some of the examples. That's the whole point. And how you fix it is doing the Gaussian elimination PP. I hope that everybody got so far. So that's, that's, that's exactly the point I want to, you to see. And also the project number two is due tomorrow midnight. I might have wrongly said before, it's Wednesday to Wednesday, actually then Tuesday to Tuesday. I hope that's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, and uh, yeah, tomorrow I think I'll also re release the new project, which will be related to what we were talking about now, on what we will keep talking about this lecture, and those are some examples of linear systems. Some very interesting examples where you apply linear systems to solve actual cool problems. We, had, we were talking about a stretchy rope problem before, right? And maybe you remember my, my drawings that is sort of modeling some, some physical system corresponds to a 1D row where each of the segments or each of the nodes has some weight subject to some boundary conditions, the row being attached somewhere, subject to some exter external forces, in this case it was gravity. And that led to what we said is a 1D Poisson equation, right? This is, this is I mean 1D Poisson equation sort of silly because there is no Laplace operator, it's just second derivative. And that's what I was talking about last time, if you still remember it, was the geometric meaning of the second derivative, right? Do you still remember it? So that if the second derivative is zero in 1D, it means it's flat locally, right? Remember this, when I was drawing toof, toof, toof. If it was like this, then I was saying it's, if it's, it's like convex shape function, I was saying it's, uh, the second derivative is positive and the opposite case when it's like this, the second derivative actually is negative. So the second derivative, derivative tells you something about the curvature. Is it sharp enough? No, it's not sharp enough. I don't know if it's sticky. Okay, better. And what I ended with, well, the problem was that, yeah, as, as the lecture keeps going on, I'm getting tired after all the days. So I ended up doing a lot of mess. So let me clarify this mess. And I was trying to give you a uh, you know, brief explanation of how this uh, stuff works in 2D so that we ultimately build up to the full Poisson equation, I guess, or at least, at least uh, the 2D case of the Poisson equation. So this is what I want to build up to, but, but because this might be too much, too much math to digest at a single slide, I was explaining it a little bit on the paper. And I made a little bit of a mess, which I would like to clarify right now. So let's uh, just quickly look at that again. So if I have a 2D function, so I have a function f, so there's a function of two parameters. So it's a function from the plane to R. Everybody see that? Everything is cool. So the way you can look at it is I have, I have my plane, which coordinates x and y, right? And every point of the plane, this function f assigns some value. So you can either look at it like colors on the plane or, or height field some sort of terrain draw all over the plane. Like if you open Google Maps and click on terrain, you see some sort of terrain visualization. So you can think of the function f being some sort of height field terrain, if you will. And I wanted to connect, I wanted to uh, say what are the partial derivatives. <laughs> so if I, let's, let's forget about those x and y's. If I pick a point x and y, it's just some arbitrary point. Let's say it's point here. Then I can define these, these two functions, just 1D functions. This will be just fx, and this will be analogously fy. So the idea of the fx function is that I will basically look at my height field just at this point y, okay? So I'll just restrict myself on this particular line, which corresponds to uh, the fixed value of y, okay? So if I should write it specific, like precisely, then fx let some, some independent variable t would be f t y, okay? So this is my 1D function fx. Again, I like to think about the type. So fx, the type of fx is just r to r. That's just a 1D function, okay? And the idea is that I, t I get it from the 2D function by holding y fixed and varying t. That's what I sort of mean by the subscript x, that the t plays the role of the parameter x. So indeed, I'm tracing the x. I'm holding the y fixed, so this is what the function fx 
everybody everybody could cool with that yeah so and I, I i and i do this so that i can say that the partial derivative of the original 2d function f by x is defined as the or original the normal 1d derivative the standard derivative of the function <coughs> fx at at my point x so that would be at some point x and y oh you can just put it like this it works at any point and similarly, I can do a function f y t, which will be a similar idea, except that going from the other side. So this time I will fix x. So this is my function f y. So f y function is also a function from r to r, right? And I get it from the 2D function by restricting myself on this line. All right? And then guess what is the partial derivative of f with respect to y? Well, it's nothing but an ordinary 1D derivative of the function y. Okay, so that's 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 how partial derivatives work. And I can once I have a sec first first derivative, I can I can apply uh, this idea again. So the partial derivatives. So the, what is the partial derivative itself? Again, if I should put there a type. So that would again be a function from R two to R, right? <laughs> So I can take another partial derivative of the partial derivative. And this is how the Laplace operator works. So the Laplace operator of f, which is sometimes it's also written like this, like this nabla squared over f, that means the same thing. In both cases, it's just Laplace and just different notations. Some people, I guess in physics, people prefer this. In math, people prefer the other or, or something like that. Doesn't matter. In both cases, for these 2D functions, it's just the sum of the second partial derivatives. So it's this plus the second partial derivative with respect to y. And this operator is very important in physics and mathematics. Why? Because it's, it sort of generalizes the idea of curvature in certain sense from 1D. That's what I was talking about here. So in 1D, the analog of the Laplace operator would be just second derivative, right? I don't have any y, so this partial derivative just becomes a normal derivative, and this is just second derivative. So that's what I was uh, talking about in the stretch a rope example, and that here the second derivative has this nice interpretation of curvature. And the Laplacian has a similar uh, interpretation in 2D. And then you can, you can probably see how you generalize it to higher dimensional functions, right? You would just put other uh, partial derivatives, like you can have Laplacian of function from R3 to R and so on. But we will, we will not look at those uh, higher dimensional cases. Okay. Uh -huh, and here is, uh, so this is sort of the continuous stuff. Okay. And here is where I started messing up the last time because when I was, uh, what we'll be doing here is doing just finite difference approximations of the operators, right? This is not a cal calculus class. So I don't care about all these uh, calculus rules and how, how to prove that these things exist and so on. That's, a, that's what you can study in calculus for like entire, maybe entire years if you want, or maybe if, even if you don't want. But what I want to do here is just a finite difference approximations of these operators. So what do I mean by that? We talked about it a little bit last time. So if my function is not exactly a continuous function, but it's only sampled on a discrete grid, Okay. So I don't know the function of this, uh, I don't know the value of the function at any point on the plane, but I know it only on some, on some grid of points. Okay, and we can assume that these points, the grid is uniformly distributed, that the spacing is equal. And then we can look at finite different approximations of the Laplace operator. So last time I worked out how the finite difference approximation of the second derivative look like, right? Do, do you remember the key stencil, the, the magic stencil? One minus two one was the stencil for the second derivative, right? The idea was that if I have a point here, if I have some f1 here, f2 here, and f3 here, then I get an approximation of the second derivative, but by doing this f1 minus 2 f2 plus f3. So this is for my finite difference approximation of the second derivative at this point. So that's what we talked about last time, okay? 
And the way we, that's what I want to explain now, better than I did before, is how to bring it to the 2D case, which is sort of obvious if you think about it. So in the 2D case, we have a function sampled on a regular grid. So let's assume those are my sampling locations and I will call these points. So this would be F12, this would be F22, this would be F2, oh wait, F32. So this is like the X coordinates, so this is F12, F22, F32. Here it would be F23, so like I'm sort of assuming that the X goes here and Y goes up. And this is F21, okay? It's just a naming convention. And I'm trying to estimate Laplacian at this point F22, okay? So what do I do? So these f12, f22, f32, and so on, those are the values of my function at these locations. And I'm trying to do is to estimate the value of the Laplacian right here in the middle. Okay, so what I need to do, obviously, is to take the discrete approximations of the individual uh, second partial derivatives, this one and this one, and sum them together, right? So let's, let's try that, okay? So I will do, so I will basically do this, or there are fi finite difference approximations of these. So the finite different approximation of the first one will be, let's make sure uh, to get it right. So this will be F12 minus two, oops, sorry, minus two F22 plus F32, right? That's the partial with respect to X. I'm looking at this row and I'll put there and I'll sum it with the second partial in this row, so the, the Y column, if you will. So that will be F23 minus two F22 again plus F21, okay? Let's put it together. Everybody cool with that? Great. So if I put it together, then I will see that I have there, all of these terms which are not in the middle will appear there once. So I'll get F12, then I get F23 plus F32 plus F21. Goodness. Minus four F22. Okay. So from this you can see the 2D pattern of the Laplacian, which is also very, very famous, I guess. And that would be this, one, 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 minus four. Okay. The other way I can write it, similar to the 2D case, I can put the four here, and I can do this, watch this, F12, you know, let me get rid of the comma, it's just annoying to write it all the time, F32, two, one, divided by four, minus F22. So why have why have done this? Why do you think I have done this? <laughs> Just because I can. It's one reason. The other reason is that here you can see that this is the average of the neighbors of F22, right? So basically the the finite difference approximation of the Laplacian, I guess I could put Laplacian of F equals this, and I guess I should put like approximated, finite difference approximated with this, and the geometric meaning of this is obvious. It's analogous to the 1D case, which we discussed the last time. It means I look at my neighbors, I compute their average, and I subtract it to my, from my value, okay? And some, sc some scaling coefficient here, this, well, oh, what is the age, by the way? As I assumed you, you knew that, do you? <laughs> what was the age here? Exactly, that's, that's the distance be between these, right? I just assume that it's the same, so that the, this distance here is the same as everywhere. So that's, that's basically my grid spacing. The point is that with finer and finer grid, the h would be getting smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I would converge to the true uh, value of, this, uh, of the second derivatives. Okay? So here, here is the intuition, which is, which is quite, quite nice, that all I need to do to get a finite difference approximation of my Laplacian is to look at my neighbors, compute their average, and subtract from myself, okay? 
So here is a cool thing which only happens in the 2D case. Like so far, like the 2D was pretty analogous to 1D, right? But here, uh, the 2D case has some nice um, special properties. So let's let's think about the case where the second. Let's let's go back for a second to the to the 1D case, and let's say that I have the second derivative equals zero. Okay, we can I guess solve a funny type of PDE. Of partial differential equation, which I guess in this case it's not even partial differential equation. So let me say that I want to solve uh, the second derivative uh, equals zero subject to some boundary condition. So f, I'm gonna zero equals a and f one equals b. So I, I don't think you have had this type of math before. Oh, sorry, something funny happened. Better. Oops, not that better. Okay, that seems to work. Oh, damn it. Why is it doing that? Okay, let's, let's hope it will hold the focus now. So, what I was gonna do is put at zero, I just fix the value somewhere. At one, I fix the value somewhere else. So this would be my A, this would be my B. And what do you think is the solution? Of this, I guess this is a differential equation, right? But here we can just eyeball the result. You don't really have to do any math. <laughs> because the, the discrete case gave you an intuition, how, how does it look like, right? Well, what does it mean for the second derivative to be zero? Think about it. So I'm only looking for a solution on this interval, right? So there must be some, I'm looking for some smooth, nicely continuous and so on function. It starts at A and ends at B. And I want the second derivative to be zero. Well, what one, yeah? So if the second derivative is zero, then the first derivative must be a constant. And if the first derivative is a constant, then you've got a straight line. Exactly, yeah. So the solution is exactly the straight line. Like just like this, that's, that's it, right? Really, really simple, stupid, no, nothing, nothing interesting happened here, right? In the discrete case, you have, you have the exact, if I, by the way, I could have solved it by discretizing it, right? In more complicated <laughs> problems, that's the only way you can really uh, solve it. And in the discrete picture, I was saying that the finite difference approximation of the second derivative is zero only when I'm, when I'm flat, when I'm linear, right? When it's just a straight line, right? Now think about the 2D case. In the 2D case, so if my <laughs> f is now from R2 to R, what does it mean for the Laplacian of f to be zero? And let's think about the discrete finite difference approximation of it. I think that's more intuitive uh, to think about. Well, it certainly means that the average of the neighbors must be equal to my value, right? That's a average of these four guys must be the same as this one, <coughs> right? But does it mean that it would have to be flat? Not really, right? Because the, cool, the, the funny thing is that the second partial with respect to x can compensate the second partial with respect to y, which is sort of cool. So here is, here is, an, here is a specific example. Here is an example. So if I have my... Uh, five points like this. Let's say that the value here is zero. So my, my f22 is zero here. My f12 would be one. I would have one here with minus one here, minus one here. Okay, so imagine it's some sort of height field. So one means like going pointing up. And minus one means like pointing down. Okay, so what happened here? The second partial with respect to our x, that's how much? two, right, if I'm computing correctly, right? So if I'm looking at an x, it looks like a locally convex function, right? If I'm looking at the y axis, it looks like concave function, right? Oh, do you know these terms, convex, concave? I mean, in, in Twitter it's like bowl shape or like hill shape, I guess. But here the second partial, the finite difference approximation of the second partial with respect to y is minus two. So plus two and minus two, well, this, this gives me perfect zero, right? 
And the function is certainly nothing like flat there. Okay? That's a cool, that's a cool difference between the 2D and 1D uh, Laplace equation. So that means if I, if I pose the problem in 2D, let's assume, let's assume I have a circle. So let's assume my domain is, a, is a, the interior of a circle. And I can specify some values on the boundary of the circle. I can specify whatever values I please. That could be like a, like a sine curve or, or anything, really. And then I can so say solve for Laplace of f equals 0 everywhere on the interior of the circle. Everywhere here must be 0. And then you will get some, some very interesting function in the middle. Th this thing is called the harmonic function or membrane interpolant. And it's, it, has very, uh, it has lots of cool mathematical properties, but also, it's also like aesthetically beautiful because it really nicely, smoothly interpolates the boundary values. Can you imagine it? Like imagine some sort of like drum, drum skin or something, where the surface of the drum is not flat, but it's arbitrary, arbitrary shaped curve. I guess, let me try to draw it. So like, if I have like a drum, but I, I decide for some reason that the boundary is not flat, but has some, some weird shape. Okay, I'm not great in drawing this. And then you can sort of stretch the skin on the drum anyway and see what is, what is the most natural state of the surface that's most likely characterized by the Laplacian of f equals zero. And now you know everything to be able to compute a solution to that in MATLAB. Because that's governed by the system of linear equations. I guess now, now is a good time to go back to this slide. Yes. Now I think this slide will, will be making a uh, whole more sense that it would make just by itself. So one way you can look at it is the, the skin of the drum. Is that the right thing to say, the skin of the drum? Yeah. On, on like a non-flat drum on the top. So you like carve like a wave or something like that. The other uh, physical uh, interpretation here is a heat diffusion. Interestingly enough, that's also governed by exactly the same operator by the Laplace operator. If you have a steady state uh, heat flow, or I hope I'm saying it right, I, I don't know these terms so well. That means that the Laplacian is zero, that there is no heat flowing anywhere, that it already stabilized itself. And if I uh, prescribe some boundary conditions, that means that I fix the temperature on the boundary of my domain, which, can, which could be a circle or could, could really be whatever, doesn't, doesn't matter what it is. I specify the values on the boundary. And if I'm looking for the steady state uh, temperature distribution over after all the heat flows have settled, that corresponds again to solving the Poisson equation. Because in, in this case, it, it would be also called Laplace equation because it has the right-hand side zero, which means it's the Laplace equation. Poisson equation is the case which we saw in the stretchy rope example, where the right-hand right side is non-zero. In the stretchy rope, we had the gravity on the right-hand side. It's just a uh, terminology thing. If the right-hand side is non-zero, it's called the Poisson equation. If it's zero, it's called sometimes the Laplace equation. That doesn't matter. What matters is that if you uh, want to solve it numerically, that's where linear algebra starts being helpful to you. So this, now you know where this came from, right? This is the finite difference approximation of the second derivative. If you put them together, you get this. And this is just a pretty standard system of linear equations, which you can solve, okay? So this example with the drum, you, you can actually solve in MATLAB. I think you know everything you need right now. You would have to scratch your head a little bit about how to write this uh, in matrix form. I'll show a l uh, in a little bit an example how to do this for the stretchy rope. For this case, it's a little bit more annoying, but it's still doable, no big deal. Okay, so this is, this is, this is a really cool example of a linear system because it gives you some, I mean, aesthetically beautiful results. <laughs> These harmonic functions are just, just beautiful. <laughs> okay, so I have a few more notes. Actually, I have one more example and some notes around it. So the, here is just a quick note that the linearity is actually occurs in nature quite often. There are some examples like light fields, electrical, electrical fields, electrical currents, and so on. They uh, obey some principle for superposition, which directly translates to the addition and scale multiplication <coughs> properties uh, to the linearity properties. So for example, a light transport, 
Uh, I'll talk about radiosity in a second, but light, light transport is one example of the linear process in nature. If I like crank up the lights by a factor of two, you will get twice as more lighting on your desks, right? If I put another light source here, like if, if the sun came on and was shining here, that the two light sources would just add up and the, the result would be additive on, of, of the final lighting. So yeah, so linearity does happen in nature even, but the important thing of linear algebra is even for things that are nonlinear, like some more complicated elasticity problems, for example, the way you solve it is anyway by linearizing it and iterating on it. That's how nonlinear techniques basically work. So this is basic for pretty much all uh, scientific computations in engineering. One very important thing is uh, sparseness, sparsity, exploiting sparsity. Always when I'm teaching the fist based class, there's always like some students who just say, oh, but well, that's impossible to solve. That's just too big, right? I'm like, did you exploit sparsity? I'm like, no, okay, that's the reason because if you do exploit sparsity, the problems that seem insolvable become solvable. So the point is that in many practical linear systems, like all of these which we have seen before, the, the linear system due to the Laplacian or just the second derivatives in 1D, they, they result in matrices which are sparse. Do you know what does it mean, sparse? <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Um, in general, there's very few. Exactly, exactly. But the important uh, bit here is what really is the ratio. So let me reiterate, you, you had exactly the right point that the spar sparse means that there is only very few non-zero elements. That most elements are guaranteed to be zero. Now what, what really mean matters here is the ratio because what I mean by most, I mean typically like asymptotically many uh, elements are non-zero, okay? So I don't mean like, like if you have like a triangle matrix, for example, that's what we talked about before, where I have zeros like in, in an entire triangle, this is not called a sparse matrix. This is a bunch of zeros, but it's not enough to be classified as sparse. By sparse, I mean like really sparse matrices, like, like the identity with bunch of, which like, with like two, uh, with two of diagonal blocks or something, some matrix that looks like this, and you can prove that an, uh, on every row, you will have only five non-zero elements. Where, where did this example come from, by the way? That would, be, that would be exactly this system, right? If you think about it, I guess if you think about it long enough, then you realize that the, the matrix that corresponds to the system of linear equations has the property that on every row, there are only five non-zero elements. No matter how big the matrix is, that could be million by million system, but every row has only five non-zero elements, okay? So that means that the total number of non-zero elements is only linear in the size of the matrix, right? Five N in this case, right? So what is the number of elements in general of matrix of size N and by N square matrix? n squared, right? So the savings going from n squared to 5n, they are enormous. If you have data structures, if you store the matrices right, and if you do the computations with the matrices right. So exploiting sparsity is really the key to efficient computations. So you need to have special data structures to store the matrices in a sparse way. I guess that's the, that's the point, right? If you have some matrix which only has like maybe 10% non-zeros and like 90% are zeros. It's not really worth it to like, uh, to really work with a, with a specialized data structure for sparse matrices. How do these data structures look like? Well, they basically, they don't store the matrix as a 2D array, as is the default way in MATLAB. They basically store just the non-zeros, right? So there is some index structure typically telling you for every row, I have index five, seven, nine, there are the non-zeros and what the values are, okay? So those are, that's, you can imagine it's much more complicated to work with these data structures, so there is some overhead to it. So if your matrix is not sparse enough, it's not worth it. If it's only like 90% zeros, not worth it. Just, just use the dense matrix, it's gonna be faster. 
But if it's significantly sparse, like you only have like a constant number of non-zeros per row or per column, it usually doesn't matter because it's asymmetric in practical cases. In that case, you really do want to use sparsity, exploit uh, sparse uh, matrix data structures. And MATLAB has, has all this. There is like a special way to deal with sparse matrices. You might have, um, I probably haven't seen this yet. So you, you always need to convert. I mean, those are like two, two basically two separate um, libraries, I suppose. You can convert between the two. You can convert from uh, sparse to dense. But if you, if you make some mistake and you do some dense calculation with a sparse matrix, it usually just like freezes your computer forever because it's so much slower. I hope I'm making some sense. I'm mixing up too many things together. So let me give you a more concrete example that will, that will give it some more sense. Our stretchy rope. That's where it, it's easily visible. Oh yeah, and the project two, uh, that will be something about splines. So there you will explore something quite related to this. So the stretchy rope, if you remember, the equations look like this. There's a system of linear equations, right? There are some boundary conditions particularly simple linear equations. If I put it all together in matrix form, I get this. So this is the, the matrix version of the system of equations, right? You can immediately see that indeed that's, that's the right thing, right? I hope you already have your part of brain for matrix vector uh, multiplication developed. So you can immediately see that this means y1 equals zero. This means y1 times k minus 2ky2 plus y3k equals mg. So that would be exactly this formula for um, y2, right? And here it keeps going. This would be the y2 times k minus 2ky3 plus ky4 and so on until I hit the final boundary condition. Remember the stretchy row, which was like attached to these two uh, concrete pillars or something. So those are the boundary conditions. <coughs> and here you can to totally see this is a perfect example of a sparse matrix. This is actually even better than just sparse because this even has a structure, right? Do you see the structure? It only has a diagonal term. So it's like almost diagonal matrix with just two off diagonal bands, I guess. This is called a a banded matrix. And banded matrices can be solved particularly efficiently. That's even better than just sparse. A sparse meant that, like, if a matrix would be sparse, that means that these could be, like, somewhere. That would, like, happen for, like, irregular meshes if you are doing, like, uh, compu computations in computer graphics on irregular triangle meshes. And these elements can be somewhere. You don't really know where they are. But here you do. They are just, like, one... Uh, one column to the left and to the right from the diagon. So in this case, the solve, even if you have like really large instance, even if you have 10 million stretch your up, you can still solve it efficiently if you take advantage of the structure of the matrix. So if it's, if it's the banded matrix, that means you are in luck because you can solve it very efficiently. Because in this case, uh, the LU factors will also be banded. So what does it mean? The L factor will look like this. <coughs> the L, remember what was the L? U, lower, upper, triangular, right? That's why it's called L and U. So it's convenient for you to remember this. So the L factor will look like this. So there'll be the diagonal. There will be some off diagonal terms, just one column to the left from the diagonal. It would be the L factor. And the U factor will be similar idea. It will be again diagonal something here, and zeros everywhere else. Zeros, 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 zeros. So that means that the back substitutions, everything here is going to be linear. All the computations are going to be linear. So that means if you have a 10 million or maybe a 100 million stretch row problem, you can solve it on your laptop, no problem. And yeah, and the, I will actually, I think I will put this in the second project. We will be doing splines, and I believe it will result in similar type of matrices, which you can solve very efficiently. Or MATLAB can solve it very efficiently for you, but the, here is why. OK. So here is the final example of um, another very cool linear system. 
which is actually which does not lead uh, to sparse matrices. Nevertheless, uh, there are some special uh, techniques which still allow you to solve it efficiently. People have been solving it a lot since the 80s because it's really cool. Radiosity. It's one of the oldest global illumination techniques in computer graphics. Well, I guess even the older one would be ray tracing, right? So let's let's start from the beginning. Let's, let's assume we have some scene and we have some light sources like windows or some light bulbs or, or whatever. <coughs> and that's uh, illuminating the scene, okay? It turns out it's relatively uh, straightforward to compute direct illumination. So what do I mean by direct illumination is that I have a light source, for example, sun, and then I have some ob obstacle, right? And I can just cast a ray from the sun. So these guys will be receiving full sunlight and these guys will be blocked, right? So here would be my shadow, right? So the shadow ends right here. That's where the sun, sun starts shining on it. And this is sometimes called the hard shadows. That's what you, those are, those are, those are the simplest types of shadows which you can often see in games and so on because it's, uh, they are very easy to generate. All you need to do is from, from every point, cast a ray to the light source. If you have multiple light sources, then you cast them to multiple light sources. And if it's blocked, then it's in shadow. If it's not blocked, then, then it's lit, okay? So that's, that's, that's direct illumination. That's, that's the simple stuff. Now, and that only gives you hard shadows. If you want to uh, get something that looks nicer, smoother, more natural, then you need to consider the multiple light bounces. You need to consider the fact that there might be some other walls <coughs> in the scene and the light when it hits the wall actually bounces off and maybe bounces here and maybe eventually arrives there, right? And the light actually bounces infinite number of times, even uh, except that every bounce sort of absorbs a little bit of the light. So depending, so then you can study the reflective properties of the surfaces and come up with, with a model uh, which models the light transport in your scene. And computing, sol solving the entire light transport problem that's called global illumination. And that's how you can get some nice lighting effect that gives you nice smooth shadows. It's not, not the most beautiful uh, example, but I think it gets the idea. And one of the basic techniques to do this is radiosity, which guess what, leads to solving a linear system. But I guess I first need to explain about a little bit what it is. So it's a finite element technique. So what does it mean? Do you have some understanding of what a finite element technique? I guess the uh, simplest explanation would be that what I do basically is discretize my scene into small triangles. If you have done anything in computer graphics, then you know that Pretty much all the models there are tessellated into some triangles. I guess here would be another. So all the surfaces of my scene are uh, triangulated. And then I say that uh, the radius that I'm computing is a linear interpolation of the values on the vertices of the triangles. Okay, so I have a, if I have a triangle, so all my scene is built from triangles. And on every triangle, I have some values, F1, F2, F3. And inside the triangle, I can just do, for example, barycentric interpolation. Or some, you know, don't, don't worry about this. I would have to probably explain a little bit more. I don't want to go into that many details. You can imagine that you can interpolate these three values anywhere inside the triangle and get some nice continuous function. That's, that's the very basic idea of finite element technique. Or even basic, even more basic one would be you would say that the entire triangle has a constant value. And the value that corresponds to the amount of light, the, this, this little patch uh, emits to the scene. And the whole point of the light transport is to compute the final, I guess, radiance, we call it, uh, or brightness value between zero and one, when one means like almost all white and zero means completely dark, if, you, if I should put it simply. And you want to relate this to the intensity of the light sources 
and the, the reflective properties of all the surfaces. Because if you have some really diffuse surfaces like black velvet or something, that's not reflecting too much light. If you have something mirrory and highly polished, that's reflecting light quite well, okay? And this is the main idea, this is the basic idea of radiosity, which leads to another interesting type of linear system. And solving that linear system gives you this beautiful global illumination effect. So people spend a lot of time thinking about these particular type of linear systems. So these patches are these little triangles I, I uh, drew before. And the equations for radiosity have this form. So let's, let's talk about a little bit what these symbols mean to give you, um, to give you the idea what, what this equation basically is trying to say. So the bi is the radiance of the patch. You can think about it, that's how bright it is. Okay, the total amount of energy, light, light is energy, as the total number, uh, amount of energy it emits, okay? And the reason I can just go ahead and compute it directly, the reason why I need to be solving a linear system is because the radiance is both on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, it's here too, okay? And that's, that's to model the li light transport, okay? So let, uh, let me, I guess let me first explain the, the symbols and then we can think about it a little bit more. So the easy one is the E. That's, I think E means for uh, emit emittivity, emissiveness, emission, something like that. That's the energy actively emitted by the patch. So that means that's only non-zero if the patch is a light source, okay? So if my patch corresponds to like these light sources and, or, or the projector or something, then the EI would be positive. That means there's some energy coming out of this particular patch. That's the easy one, right? The interesting one is this one. So this one, uh, those are the, the BJs are, we are summing over all patches. The BJs are the radiances of all the individual patches. And the FIJ is the form factor or sometimes called configuration or view factor or something like that. In, in any case, it's basically a measure of how well two patches I and J see each other or more, accurate, more accurately, so the fraction of the energy leaving patch number J and reaching patch number I, okay? So let me give you, I guess, let me give you an idea. If I have two patches, so there's one patch with this normal, there is another patch with this normal. So this, if this is my I, this is my J. And then the form factor FIJ between the two, what do you think it is? Is it big or is it small? And if there is another case like this, I have one patch, it's looking like this, there's another patch, just pointing this way. So here, this is my I, this is my J. What do you think is the form factor IJ here, as opposed to here? So the idea is to, I, I'm not gonna do it properly, I would need like probably a whole lecture <coughs> to explain this properly. But the idea is the fraction of energy leaving one patch and arriving on the other one. So where do you think it will be bigger? On the left? On the right? Yes, yes, here, certainly. Because intuitively these two patches can see each other much better, right? If there will be lots of light coming from here, probably lots of it will go here, right? Here, the opposite case, right? I guess if they are pointing completely away from each other, if it would be something like this, one would be pointing like this, the other one would be pointing like this, it would be zero. Or if it's completely blocked by some obstacle, then, then it would be zero. So this form factor basically accounts for the geometry of the scene. It only depends on the geometry of the scene. Doesn't really depend on the lighting, which is sort of cool because it's constant for, for the scene. It can be changing your light sources. The, this FIJ will not change. And what this means basically go over all patches, take the radiance of each patch, multiply it by the form factor, sum it all together, and then multiply it by RI. That's the last symbol I need to explain. The RI is the reflectivity of the patch. So that basically describes how mirror-like the patch is. If the patch is highly reflective like a mirror, then the RI will be high. If it's um, matte, if it's not reflective, if it absorbs all the light that hits it, then the RI will be low or zero if it just absorbs everything, okay? So now you know everything. So this, uh, this uh, explains this uh, describes in mathematical terms the light transport in the scene. And what we are solving for are, are the Bs, basically like the, like the steady state of this, that's, that's, where, that's where it settles. 
after infinite number of bounces of the light, what will be the radiance of every patch? So after you write the system uh, in a matrix form and solve it, you get solution global illumination, which looks something like this. Very beautiful. Now the interesting thing, in this case, you don't really get a sparse system. Let's think about a, a little bit intuitively what the sparsity of the matrix means about the problem. Why don't, I'm saying here we don't get a sparse system, usually. If I have a scene like this, which is just a box, just a box, cave or something, with like one light source, what do you think the sparsity of this matrix will be? compared to the sparsity of the systems we talked about before, like the stretch a rope or the 2D Poisson actuation. Yeah? Maybe significantly more sparse. Which one? <laughs> the cave. The well, oh, okay, so I, what I mean is that my patches here, <clears throat> or maybe think about like a room that's better than the cave, like, like this room, for example, right? <clears throat> So if I discretize this room with little triangles, imagine like paint little triangles everywhere, those will be my patches, right? Like a million patches, no problem, for the sake of the experiment, right? So what do you think the form factors between any two patches will be? How many of them will be zero? Not too many, right? Because if I draw a triangle here and triangle over there, they'll probably see each other to some extent, right? You can all see each other, right? So the matrix due to radiosity will probably not be very sparse unless you have something like a complex cave with like, like a labyrinth where the light cannot shine from a distant part to, a, to another part. I guess that, sorry, I, maybe I confused it with it. Forget about the cave, think about a room. But if you have like an entire, if you have entire building like here, right, the light from here probably does not really travel to my office or somewhere far away. So in that sense, it would be like a little bit sparse. But compared to the sparsity of the, like think about the stretchy rope and the sparsity. What, so what does the sparsity really mean? intuitively. It means that the individual components of my unknowns interact together, right? So in the stretchy rope, it meant if I had the stretchy rope, which was something like this, was like the elements were like this, right? It could move. Ah, you know, let me better draw it. So I had like nodes of a bridge or something, right? So in that case, the matrix was sparse because uh, the force at this element depended only on its two neighbors. Okay, in this case, the light of every patch depends on all of them pretty much, if all of them see each other. Okay, do you get it? Okay, great. So nevertheless, even though this particle system is not sparse, lots of smart techniques have been developed to solve it efficiently. You can study this in computer <laughs> graphics forever if you want to. <laughs> We'll not study it forever. We will instead look more on to, unless you have some questions to this, or in general, I guess that this is the applications part of the course. <coughs> and sort of trying to mix some theory with some applications. <laughs> so if not, then we can move on to a little more of theory, I guess, not very difficult theory, some more uh, matrix uh, operations. I haven't talked properly about transposition, even though that's one of the one of the basic uh, matrix operations, and we will need it uh, quite a lot in the future. So let's go back, let's shift gears to the theory uh, mode. So transposition means swapping the row of rows and columns in the matrix, okay? When I write it, when you read it in a book or in the slides, then you uh, just denote it with the, with the T, like to the power of T. It doesn't mean, really mean any power, it means transpose. And yeah, in, Mat in MATLAB instead you have this prime operator. Have you, have you, have you used it yet? Transpose things, okay, so you, so you know what it's doing, right? So here is a simple example. So what, what the transpose does, it takes the rows and makes them columns. Very simple, right? So in general, this was just an example, I guess I, in general I could, I have a few comments actually on this, which is good to clarify. So if I have a general matrix, doesn't even have to be square or anything, can be rectangular, transposition just applies to anything. And AT just means that I take these rows and write them as column vectors instead. 
guess I should give them a rose to be a little <coughs> better citizen. That's what it means. So if my original matrix was n by m, what is the dimensions of AP? I want a quick answer. Someone yell it. <laughs> m by n, correct. Because you can clearly see if this, this one, well, like here, right? If this one is a rectangle like this, the transpose will be like this, right? And I guess you could also write it, so if I was to f define it formally, that the element i and j of the transpose matrix is the j and i element of the non-transpose matrix, okay? Now at this point, it's good to uh, talk a little bit about the column vector convention. So I guess from now on, when I'll be talking about vectors, I'll be talking about column vectors by default. So column, by column vector, I mean this. X1, X2, up to some X <coughs> n. Okay, so column vector is really nothing but n by one matrix, okay? And if I want to get a row vector out of it, if I want to do, uh, if I want to be working with this, x1, x2 to xn, aka one by n matrix, then I need to apply the transposition operator to it, okay? So with, the, with this convention, I should be really writing, and in the following, I really be writing it like this, because by default, these vectors are interpreted as column vectors, so if I want to refer to a row vector, I need to transpose it. Okay, that's a convention that is used in, in, in many books and papers on, on this topic, but usually without, without even mentioning it, so keep that in mind. Oh, by the way, this is useful because <coughs> if you remember the inner product, which we talked about, so if I have X and Y from Rn, we defined in one of the very first lectures, the inner product between X and Y, right? And using the transposition, I can just write it as X dy. Does everybody see why? Because what it is, actually there is an interesting, so the xt, now I know that xt will be a row vector, right? y will be a column vector, they both have the same dimension, so this would be um, one by n matrix, this would be an n by one matrix, so the result will be what? One by one matrix, just a scalar. Right, and I get it by. So the nice thing is that the matrix matrix product basically gives me inner product. So I don't really I don't really need this special notation for the inner product anymore. I can just be writing x d y and referring to standard matrix multiplication. That's how you can do it in MATLAB too. I guess that's why in MATLAB you don't have a special thing for inner product because you can just do it this way. What would be y t x let's do a little bit of an exercise what would be y t x if again x and y are n-dimensional vectors so f i guess the, the, the question has two parts first of all what is the type of the thing right and second what is the value so here I did x, x t y right and i wonder ah, what if what if i did it the other way around what if i, if I just did y t x so again by convention when i'm talking about vectors and dimensional vectors what i really mean is column vectors that means n by one matrices so what is y t x it's not there's no trick there let me <laughs> just tell you that much It is the same thing, <laughs> because y t x, by definition, it would be the dot product of y x, which we know that's the same as x y, which, which is x t y, right? If you if you just write it out like that, so y t would be a row vector, x would be a column vector, you compute exactly the same thing as here. So it's one by one matrix, the value is exactly the same. x t y, y t x, the same <laughs> thing, okay? The other way you could see, if I, it's sort of silly, but if I have a one, one by one matrix transposed, what is it? Well, the same thing, right? Transposing one by one matrix is the only case that doesn't really do anything to it. 
it's trivial, but it's actually used. <laughs> now, here's a slightly more interesting uh, question. What would be, I don't want to go away from this, what would be x, y, t? So again, x and y are uh, n-dimensional vectors, meaning n by 1 matrices. So what is x, y, t? So first of all, the type. By the type, I mean what really? What are the dimensions of the matrix? And by n, that's correct. Yes. So this would be an n by n matrix. It's a funny type of matrix product if you think about it. X is a column vector. Y is a row vector, right? So this will. So this is. Uh, sorry, n by 1, 1 by n. So indeed, it has to create an n by n matrix, right? And how it's created? Well, I'm taking scalar multiplies of this of this row, right? By this, this value, this value, and so on. I'll talk about this in more detail later. This is a special type of matrix, rank 1 matrix, which will be important later. All right, so... Let's look at some very basic properties of transposition. So this is this is one property that you absolutely must remember. If you don't know it already, maybe you do already. So how uh, transposition works on matrix product. So if I have two matrices which are compatible, so I can multiply them. So if I transpose the product C, I get multiplication of the transposes in the in the reverse order. So I guess I can also write it like this. If I transpose the product of A, B, I get the product of B, T, A, T. Okay. Don't forget this, that the order of the multiplication flips. So why is that? Let me give you a graphical proof. That's my favorite way of proving things. And here it, here it actually works. Y12, except that I might mean, need a separate paper to do this justice. So let's try it like this. That might work. So let me take a matrix A, should be like this. So <coughs> let's let's practice the new convention. So this would be row vectors A1T up to AMT, okay, and it will be some other row vectors. So this would be a matrix A, which is M by N. And another matrix B, which has to be able to multiply with it. So this, this side should be the same as length as this one. Let's, let's make it a little bit fatter to make it, this, this other side can be arbitrary. And this would be columns B1. So no transposition here, those are column vectors. B1 to B K, let's say. So this is a B matrix, which is N by K. And if I multiply them together, I get my matrix C. which is M by K matrix, okay? So if I look at row I and column J, I get some element CIJ, right? And what is the value of the element CIJ? You should know this. You do know this, you just <laughs> need to remember it. That's just matrix matrix multiplication, right? Then I will put there the transposes and we will see that this, this rule indeed is true. <coughs> So how do I get the element in the row I and column J of my matrix product? I guess that's the mental picture of matrix multiplication I would like you to develop in your brain. <laughs> okay. Is it too, too, too trivial that you are? <laughs> Well, it's simple, right? I need to take the row number I from matrix A and column number J from matrix B. So with this notation, actually the not I picked the notation exactly so I can write it nicely. So it's the dot product of AI transpose and BJ, right? That means I row from A with J column from B. So that's BJ, that's I, AI, that's, that's the volume. That's a different way how we could write matrix matrix product. Okay, so let's let's write the transpose matrices. So let me transpose B 
See if I can get the dimensions approximately right. So this would be my B transpose. So what are the dimensions of B transpose? That's right. And the values will be B1 transpose, right? That would be the first row. And the last one will be BK transpose, okay? Let me now transpose A. So the transpose of A will be N by M, right? And what I will have in the columns will be A1 up to AM vectors. A1. So I'm in luck. I can I can multiply it, right? If I multiply it, I will get a K by M matrix. Let's call <coughs> it D. Which is a K by M matrix. And let's say for strategic reasons, let's say if I take row J and column I, so there will be some element D, J, I, what I will have there, D, J, I. It's exactly the same idea as before, right? So let's, let's get the indices right. Does somebody dare to say it? <laughs> no? It's just about not messing up the indices, that's all it's about. So I said I want column, uh, sorry, row number J, column number I. So that means I have to take row number J from B, right? That would be BJ transpose. And column number I for matrix A, AKA AI. I probably should not be saying AKA because it's all making it more confusing. And you know that this is the same as doing AI transpose BJ, right? Uh -huh, but that's nothing but CIJ, see that? So indeed, this matrix is nothing by the transpose of this. In other words, D is just C transpose. That's exactly what I wanted to prove. So if I multiply the transposes in the opposite, oh, sorry, it was supposed to be AT. The transposes in the opposite order, and on transpose, I will get the same thing. Uh, in other words, A, B transpose is B transpose, A <coughs> transpose, and here is Y. Got it? Okay, and finally we can talk a little bit better about matrix inverse. I sort of broached the topic a little bit because I needed matrix inverse when we are talking about coordinate transformations. But here we'll talk about matrix inverse for general matrix and general and dimensional matrix. Not that general though, because we need a square matrix. So we need A to be N by N. So when we are transposing matrices, it could be rectangle matrix, no problem. But matrix inverse only is defined for a square matrix. So that's one of the few things you actually have to remember. You will then like define like a pseudo inverse or rectangular matrix and so on, but that's, that's something slightly different. So remember, standard inverse only applies to a square matrix. And the inverse matrix has the property that if I multiply it with the original matrix, I get the identity. It doesn't always have to exist, right? I think I showed you an example before. Do you remember? Can you tell me a quick example of a matrix where the inverse doesn't exist? Zero. Zero. Yeah, that's that's a perfect example. <laughs> There's no way I can invert a matrix full of zeros, right? If you want a slightly more, uh, just slightly more interesting example, then this this one would also work, right? It also cannot invert. But sometimes you can have matrices where it doesn't look like anything like this, and it's still non-invertible. So it's not, not always that simple. So let's, let's think about how can I find the inverse of a matrix, how to compute the inverse of a matrix, or determine that doesn't exist. In, in, in some cases, it doesn't really exist, right? So let's say that I have a matrix A, but I don't know what is this inverse. How can I compute it? I don't think about it. So draw a diagram of the situation. So here A is a square matrix, n by n. <coughs> here is an unknown matrix that's gonna be the inverse, but I don't know what it's gonna be yet. So I'll just say it has some columns x1 to xn, 
right? It's also going to be n by n matrix, by the way. The, the inverse must have the same dimensions, of course. It also, also needs to be square matrix because it's I. That means an n by n identity. Uh, I thought it was clear. I hope it's clear. So this needs to give me the n by n identity. That means this. Let me write it like this, actually. This will be good. So what are these guys? Those are the standard basis vectors, right? The E1, E2 to EN. I hope you remember this. And if I write it like this, do you see a way how you could find a matrix inverse using what we, what we discussed before? <coughs> the code you wrote for your project number two, for example? <laughs> yeah? You could set this up as A, B equals I equals A, B equals X. A, B equals, I'm, you mean, I guess you mean AX equals B, right? Oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's the common convention, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's exactly the idea. Because you, you, the, I guess the only trick here is to remember that matrix magic multiplication, I can break it down to multiplying individual columns of the matrix. That's why I also wrote it like this, right? So all you need to do here is to solve these individual linear systems. AX1 equals E1. E1 is the standard basis vector. That's the one and then, then the rest of zeros. That's my E1 you remember this to get ex2 to, to get x2 i solve this linear system and so on okay so to compute the matrix inverse i can just solve n linear systems okay so if i was in matlab i can just do x1 equals a backslash one zeros x2 would be a backslash zero one zeros and so on Okay, now one thing, what is the inverse immediately useful for? It's, it's the solution operator of a system of linear equations. So what do I mean? If I later come and give you a system of linear equation AX equals B, if you have already taken the trouble to compute the inverse, you immediately can tell me the solution, right? Because I can do A inverse A, X equals A inverse B. This is identity. So that means that X is immediately A inverse B, right? So the A inverse just applied as a linear transformation to the right-hand side. That's what I meant by solution operator. If I just take the right-hand side and, and apply it to A inverse, gives me immediately the solution, okay? By the way, if I give you just one right-hand side, then you could certainly solve it like this, if, if you know that you have only one right-hand side that will ever matter, then it's very, that's usually a very bad idea to be computing the inverse and computing the solution this way. Why is that? Because as you can see from here, by computing the inverse, you actually compute the entire solution operator. You compute the solution for all right-hand sides. Because you sort of see it here, right? You sort of, this, this, this is basically a basis of the space of all possible right-hand sides. And the solution operator means the individual solutions for the individual standard basis vectors. So the A inverse is computing much more than just one solution of a linear system. In a sense, computes all solutions to the, to the linear system for all possible right-hand sides. So usually numerically or efficiency wise, it's usually a bad idea to compute the inverse. And it's particularly a bad idea if your system A was sparse. Because even for a sparse system, unless it's a very special type of sparse system, but for most sparse systems that you encounter in practice, the inverse is actually not going to be sparse at all. It's going to be dense. And that's not what you want. Because if this matrix was a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix, only had like five non-zeros per row, it was a 50,000 matrix, but the inverse would be how much? It'd be 100 million values, right? So you don't, you don't want to do that. That's why there is like an entire s industry of sparse direct solvers that let you solve uh, sparse systems like this <coughs> without ever computing the inverse. But I guess I'm thinking of myself. <coughs> so here is an example. <coughs> Let 
Here we see an example. Uh, so we just inver invert this matrix. So just as I said, we just solve a bunch of linear systems. And if you do that, I'm not gonna do it now. I would probably mess it up anyway. You can try it in MATLAB if you want that this is indeed correct. But it, or you can just substitute it here and you can verify that these are the right solutions. Why not, right? And that the inverse basically just put these vectors in columns of a matrix and that's Y inverse, right? If I now do A times A inverse, I must <coughs> get an identity matrix, right? Perfect. Now, there's a catch. The inverse doesn't have to exist, by the way. So how would I detect that the inverse doesn't exist? So uh, what do I need to do? I would have to run Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting. And if all the pivot elements are non-zero, that means that I can always solve this for any B, so in particle for all the standard basis vectors that guarantees that the inverse is going to exist. Okay, and there's a last thing which is analogous to the transposition operation, how to invert matrix products. So if I have a product of matrices A and B and I want to invert the thing, so C is A times B and I want to invert C, that turns out it behaves similarly to the transposition. So I can invert the individual factors individually. I can do B inverse, A inverse, but I need to flip the order. Why is that? That's, that's sort of obvious because if you take the B inverse and A inverse and multiply with AB, due to matrix multiplication associativity, I can write it like this. But I assume that B inverse is the correct inverse of B, so that's identity, right? Identity goes away, doesn't do anything, and AA inverse is identity. <coughs> so that proves that the C inverse, or this B inverse, A inverse, indeed is the C inverse. I guess I should really like denote it something else, like D, and then say from this follows that this is indeed the C inverse, if I was like to be pedantic, I guess. Okay, and I think this is a good point to stop, unless you have some questions. <laughs> no? Okay, thank you very much. I'll see you on Wednesday.